everyone, and welcome to Photo Masters Live. I'm your host, Ian Plant, and today uh, we are joined by an incredible photojournalist, Andy Morrison. He's with the uh, Detroit News, and we're going to talk about the art and craft of photojournalism, and he's going to tell us some of his exciting stories, some of his weird celebrity encounters, and some of the great photo stories that he's worked on during his career. Andy, welcome to the program. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, it's uh, so you are you're now living in Detroit or the Detroit area, right? We were exactly. I mean, I actually was in that area for a while. I used to be in Ann Arbor. I went to law school there, believe it or not. Uh, so I'm in a little I actually live on a little island called Grozeal, and it's we're about 20 miles south of Detroit. Uh, it's an island in the in the Detroit River right at the mouth of Lake Erie. We've, um, I say little. It's a town. We probably got 10,000 people on the island anyways or. I think we're made up of actually six or seven islands. As my son, my son who likes science, likes to point out, we're an archipelago, not really an island. But you know, <laughs> yeah, he sounds like a real smarty pants. <laughs> yeah, well, he thinks he is, but yeah. So I'm, I'm probably by car, um, you know, 25 minutes from downtown Detroit. Well, everyone, as you come in and join us, uh, please feel free to go into the chat box and say hello. Tell us where you're coming from. Looks like we've got about 20 or 30 people that have come in so far, and we'll uh, kind of just kill a little time with some small talk while we're waiting for everyone to come on in. But please tell us where you're from. Uh, I always like to see people from all around the world coming and attending this program. So the most remote location from the United States will win today. Now, you're not going to win anything. You're just going to win the prize of victory. So... <laughs> So uh, as we go along, uh, if you have any questions for me or Andy, feel free to just put them in the chat. You don't need to put them in the Q&A only. Unfortunately, uh, we don't have the ability to let people raise their hand and ask questions. Uh, so if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat box. Looks like we've got uh, Kaylee from the UK. That's maybe going to be the winner here. So let's take a – oh, well, you've got a few folks from Ann Arbor. So uh, very We're close to where you are, Andy. Yeah, uh, Germany is the new uh, is the new uh, destination farthest away from our location. So I'm curious where Kaylee is from in the UK. My mother in law uh, and father in law are from Birmingham. Oh wow! Okay. Oh well, Slovenia just took the lead. Okay. <laughs> just got Mike Gomez from Minnesota. He's in my neck of the woods. Hey, Mike, how's it going? Thanks, everyone, for joining us. All right. Well, um, Andy, I'm just going to start off by asking you to talk about your origin story as a professional photographer, how you got into the game, when you got into the game, and what you've been doing since that time. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I always uh, wanted to be a photographer ever since I had a, my first Pentax in my hands Um when I was in my was as a teenager in the in the 1980s, I'm kind of giving you my age, but um, always loved photography. And I remember I was on, you know, the yearbook high school staff and everything. And I remember specifically uh, people on the staff telling me, you know, when I said I wanted to be a photojournalist, I, people say, well, you know, you got to do something else. You'll never you'll never make it as a photographer. <laughs> and um so in high school counselors, you know, you need to think of doing something else. And uh, even, even my father, who was very supportive, um, got so desperate at trying to get me to do something other than journalism. You know, he suggested I become an actor. And I said, uh, that's a little bit more volatile than journalism is. But uh, long story <laughs> short, so I, I went to college on a wrestling scholarship. Um, like most people, I, you know, uh, bounced around a couple different um, degree programs, started in psychology, went to radio and TV. And then when I decided I really needed to be a, um, a photojournalist is what I wanted to be, I transferred to the University of Kansas, um, got my journalism degree and and uh, went from there. Did a ton of internships while I was in college um, and then uh, moved out to Ohio um, uh, from Kansas and bounced around a couple uh, smaller papers, and then ended up in in Detroit. And so, I mean, you know, what was it about photography that uh, 
really grabbed you? I mean, why why is it that you think you chose that as a career? Well, there were two things. I loved the mechanical operation of the camera. I loved having a camera in my hands. Um, back then, you know, with um, uh, in the film days, it, it was magical seeing seeing pictures come to life in a in a print tray, you know, in front of your eyes was something that we don't we don't get um, in digital photography. Uh, you know, even even processing an image in raw, it's it's just not the same. You know, watching that thing just come from a white sheet of paper into a into a picture was great. Um, so I liked that, but I also liked um, you know having a camera was a license to be a little bit voyeuristic and to talk to people and and see things and and um, I I just I liked that whole I liked that whole process um, and I never was big on doing darkroom work that was probably my least favorite um, part of photography except for when the picture would magically appear on the paper uh, but I think it's just that I'm. I've always been very curious. I'm an outgoing person most of the time. And um, I just have always liked that, um, that having the camera and having, you know, the, the press ID is, it's just a license to talk to people and ask questions. Um, and I didn't realize that at the time, I don't think, um, because, you know, I was mostly just snapping pictures for fun, but um mm -hmm. I just I always just like that that process of of composing and looking through the viewfinder and and trying to you know capture the moment. So Andy and I met uh this winter up on Lake Superior. So I was up there photographing the quote unquote ice caves that form up there in the winter. The, there's all these sandstone cliffs and caves up there. And in the winter the there's a lot of water that seeps through the sandstone. It's a very porous rock. And so all that water turns into these beautiful icicles that hang down from these caves and these cliffs. And it's really very spectacular. It's kind of somewhat similar to the glacial caves that you'll see in Iceland. It's not quite the same thing, uh, but it's got sort of that same feel. And, you know, a lot of people who go and photograph these caves are like, you know, wow, you know, this is <laughs> this is great. I don't have to go to Iceland to photograph ice caves. Uh, so, you know, it's not the same thing. It's not quite as good. I mean, the, the ice caves in Iceland are carved when meltwater goes through the glacier or ice. And so they can be a lot more intricate and a lot bigger. Uh, but still, it's a lot of fun on Lake Superior. And so, Andy, you were up there working on a story for the Detroit News. Yeah, we do a series called Michigan Marvels, and I'm one of the producers of it. I'm I'm one of the one of two drone pilots at the newspaper uh, with our FAA Part 107s. And what Michigan Marvels is, um, it's a series that essentially explores the state, and we kind of highlight the things, the uh, places, and things that are uniquely Michigan. And um, again, that's a license for me to get away for a couple of days and and go see some really great things. Um, and we've been wanting to do the ice caves. Um, they, they hadn't been last year. The ice wasn't all that great. Uh, so I made contact up there and it looked like, um, the ice was good. So I think, um, after I was called saying, you know, Hey, you need to come on up. I probably was there within two days, uh, loaded my truck up and, and, uh, went up for, I think I was up there for three or four days. I probably did uh, three different assignments while I was up there and um, a lot of drone flying. Um, the Michigan Marvels are fun because, you know, I'll use drones, GoPros, iPhones, my regular DSLRs, pretty much whatever I have um, to, you know, make pictures and video. Uh, so Went up, did a short interview, and um, and thank you for the goggles. By the way, that would have been a miserable day had I had you not let me borrow your goggles. Um, that was a, a longer ride out to, to Grand Island than what I thought it was going to be, and cold, much much colder. Um, yeah, it, so it, just it, uh, it, give everyone a little bit of the backstory behind that. So uh, I work up there with a guy named Scott Kuzmyrek. He's my ice cave guy. He's also my video production guy. He's my marketing manager. Uh, he also used to be a drummer for the band, The Gin Blossoms. And so Andy went up there 
to interview Scott and Scott was the one who took him out to the ice caves. I was there cause I was working with Scott doing photography tours. And so I had a day off for my tours. Uh, Scott said he was going to take Andy out. I tagged along. I lent uh, Andy a pair of goggles because the snowmobile ride out to the Island, there's a lot of wind hitting your face. And so it can be really bad on the eyes. So I gave him a pair of ski goggles, which helped out immensely. <laughs> and uh, uh, we spent a good a better portion of the entire morning out there. Actually, Andy, you were out there for like uh, five or six hours, I think, photographing. It, it was. That was kind of mm-hmm. interesting when you guys said uh, you were going back on shore and you took off. And then I, I sat there for a minute <laughs> and I thought, well, I hope they come back. Um, and it wouldn't be the first time I'd I wouldn't be the first time I'd been stranded on a remote island. Uh, we, I got a ride out to an island um, in Lake Erie years ago from the Coast Guard. Uh, to do a story on uh, this great big uh, rookery out there, uh, great blue herons and egrets. And the problem was the cormorant. This was in the early 90s, I think, mid to early 90s. And um, the cormorants uh, had taken over the island and were causing a lot of damage. And they dropped me off in the morning. We're going to pick me up at 6 o'clock. And 6 o'clock came and went, and, and they didn't show up. And that was the days before cell phones. It didn't have a radio, barely had any water, a couple candy bars. And they came about nine o'clock after they realized they'd forgotten me. <laughs> I was just sitting <laughs> up the beach. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, a lot of crazy not. things happen to professional photographers. And, you know, folks, if you guys haven't seen my ice cave images and you want to check them out, in a previous episode of Photomasters Live, I actually talked about a lot of my ice cave photos can't remember which one. It was either the one with Joe Rossback or the one with Kurt Budliger. So if you go to the Photomasters live or sorry, the Photomasters website and go to the live page, you can find the replays of those previous episodes. Um, but I thought it'd be a good idea to pull up Andy's photos. So I got a chance to work with Andy because of this interview, uh, this article he was writing. He interviewed me for it as well. And I uh, went over to Andy's website and I was blown away by his photos. And so why don't we dive right into those and start, uh, talking about um, uh, your many years of photojournalism. I think that the best way is to, uh, to illustrate that is to show the photos. And sorry, just give me a moment here. I've got to backtrack through the presentation. I was showing Andy the photos that I picked for the presentation and uh, I left it at the end of the presentation. And now I've just got to backtrack through all the slides to get to the beginning. It'll just take me a moment here. Uh, but, uh, you know, one thing about photojournalism that I think you know, really strikes me is is that it is in many ways uh, the ultimate expression of something that all photographers should be trying to do at all times, and that's tell a story. I'm always telling people tell a story with your photos, and photojournalism is just really the pinnacle of that attempt to find those stories and to translate those stories for the viewers. And so, I, there's a lot of different ways to tell stories as a photographer, and I think. A lot of photographers think that all they have to do is wait for those interesting moments and capture those moments when something interesting happens. And that's part of the storytelling process. But what I really was impressed with about Andy's work is that he understands how important visual design is to telling the story as well. That, you know, you're not always going to be able to convey what the real story is with your photograph. You know, a photograph is just a truncated view of reality. You you take away motion and the passage of time, you know, so a video might be more effective at telling a story than a photograph. And so you've got to kind of fit in all these story cues into the photograph to tell that story, but you also have to visually engage the audience. And I think that the very best photojournalists are artists. Maybe they're artists in disguise. You know, they're out there trying to tell the story, but the best photojournalists recognize when those artistic moments happen. You know, in this first photo that I chose uh, for this presentation that uh, Andy took, to me, exemplifies exactly what I'm talking about. What I really love about this photo isn't the story, it's the visual design. It's the colorful composition and the use of complementary color. So let's just talk a little bit more about that, Andy, your approach to making photos. What is What is it that you're looking for? And what is it that kind of sticks out to you? What is it that causes you to reach for your camera? And trigger your shutter. Well, it's it's always um, trying to tell the story first, and you know, seeing a moment and everything. Now, in, in this particular uh, photograph, um, this was a group called the Blue Dolphins, and they were 
senior senior citizen um, synchronized swimming team. I think the average age was probably like 75 or something like that. Um, and so naturally, it you know, to shoot the story, yeah, I needed to be underwater. And, and that's I, I've been an underwater photographer for uh, and a scuba diver for over 20 years. Uh, so that was kind of a natural thing for me when it comes to the color of the design and everything. So, so much of that, especially like with this story is really just reacting to what they're doing. And then, uh, you know, it's in the editing stage where it, a, a shot like this kind of, kind of pops out and I say, okay, that's, you know, what I'm looking for. It's got the, it's, it's got the design elements that, that I find pleasing and photojournalism is, is a real, um, it's a real mix of that. It's, it's, you have to be reactive. You have to be ready to shoot at all times. Um, you know, one of the things I tell young photographers is if you're inside shooting an assignment, you know, before you even step out onto the, onto the sidewalk, return your camera to base is what I call it. Um, you know, my base setting is aperture priority ISO 500 at five, six. So when I walk outside, if somebody's having a problem or if there's spot news going on, as soon as I walk out the door, I can pick up my camera and start shooting. It's not left at, you know, 6,400 or something like that. Um, so you have to be ready for those moments at all time. But you also have to realize that, you know, some things may not tell a, uh, a great story or the picture might not tell a story. It's just the lighting. You know, maybe it's a mm -hmm. shaft of light coming down from somewhere. Um, and maybe it's just the aesthetic that's carrying the the picture. Um, but as a photojournalist, you know, you're looking for all that. And when everything comes together and you get the great light and it tells a story, that's your sort of your your nirvana. Um, and and that doesn't happen all the time. I mean, we shoot, um, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of photographs uh, every year. Um, and and still, you know, you're surprised when when everything kind of kind of comes together. So in this particular case it was a lot of time underwater with these ladies, um, you know, went to a couple different practices and then you start to learn their routine. And, OK, this is they're going to do this particular move. So I want to be on this side and um, and and that sort of thing. But so you know, you're never telling them what to do. You're just trying to trying to get in the right spot when you know something's going to happen. Yeah. And, you know, the elements of visual design that I love here, first of all, is that complementary color contrast. You've got the blue of the water, and then you've got that one lady with that bright pink swimsuit that really pops out. And it's also the shapes, the, 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 the women as they're swimming, they're splayed out. They're creating this beautiful radial shape. It's very dynamic. It really brings the viewer into the scene. So even if the story is, pretty obvious here, or if the story isn't particularly compelling, you can still make a compelling connection with the viewer by just, you know, sticking to the fundamentals of good design and really making a strong dynamic composition. And, you know, one thing that's really interesting about photojournalism is that often you have to find beauty out of tragedy. You know, a lot of the shots that you have that I picked for this presentation are shots where horrible things are happening, but still you saw something beautiful, something artistic in that moment. And, you know, this shot, I think, is a good example. Uh, you know, the, the, the car has turned over. There's clearly been an accident here. But it's really just a beautiful shot, especially with that rainbow coming down in the background. And, you know, so, you know, your job as a photojournalist is to, is to take these moments, good, the bad, and the ugly, and transform them into something that's compelling, something that's going to resonate with the viewers. And, you know, I always think that, that the key to successful photography or any type of art is to find beauty where others might not see it. And sometimes uh, the story is just going to present itself to you. Sometimes you're going to have something really interesting going on, and uh, it's going to be compelling on, on many levels for the viewer. And sometimes the story is just going to be a little bit weird, should I say. So please tell us the story behind this photo. Uh, it was really, really simple. Uh, weird <laughs> Uh, Weird Al Yankovic, who I'm a big fan of, um, and even a bigger fan after meeting him, um, he was in town, or he was 
he was in town to promote some upcoming shows and we secured an interview with him right outside of his hotel on the riverfront. And, you know, mind you, I, I've met, I've met a lot of celebrities and athletes and, you know, famous people over the years from, from the Dalai Lama on down, um, you know, photographed every sitting president back to Reagan and everything. And, and Weird Al was the the nicest celebrity I've ever met, the most down to earth, just genuine. I, I can't say enough good things about him. And I'm and I'm thinking, you know, how am I gonna photograph this guy and make it interesting? And it was a really gray day outside, just awful, you know, but he's such a colorful person. So I just decided I'd just go really hard, you know, hard strobe on him. And he had the colorful shirt on and the crocs on. And, um, I, you know, I was kind of joking with him and I shot some different pictures and I said, I started to say, you know, Hey, can you do something a little more? And, and he cut me off and he said, you mean weird? (laughs) And I I said, well, I wasn't really going to say that, but yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. And so he hopped up on that thing and just started doing some different poses and, uh, you know, he's real media savvy and it's kind of like, um, kind of like photographing uh, fashion models, you know, the really good fashion models, the, you know, the ones that are, do it for a living that are pros. It's like turning on a light switch. You yeah. flip the switch, they start going through the poses and it's like shooting sports. You know, I mean, it's not that difficult um, to make a good image. Uh, and, and Weird Al was a little bit like that. Um, mm. But and as much as I, I like this portrait um, an awful lot, just the memory of what a great guy he is was what um, was my takeaway and the thing that I remember the most. He was just so, so gracious. Um, I photographed other very, very big celebrities that I won't name that are, you know, Academy Award winners. And, and it was, you know, are you know, five clicks and are you done? And it's like, <laughs> I haven't even warmed up yet, but yeah, I guess we're done. Uh, so um, yeah, he was, he was a real treat. I, I love that guy. Yeah. My wife worked for many years, uh, uh, as a volunteer for this celebrity golf, uh, charity event. So she got to meet a lot of celebrities and she's got some great stories about the, uh, the ones that are good and the ones that are not so good and the ones that are just absolutely horrible. So yeah, once again, I won't name names either, but what I love about this photo, I mean, obviously it's colorful, it's dynamic, but the, the two things I love the most about this are one, how you use that dramatic stormy sky. Like a lot of times when photographers have overcast skies, we just don't get excited if we're shooting outdoors. Uh, But you turn that into an asset here by doing a little bit of underexposure and just bringing out that stormy texture. And the second thing I love about this is that crooked horizon. I'm so jealous of this. As a landscape (laughs) photographer, I can never have a crooked horizon. And here, that was exactly what you needed to really tell this story. So that's a great photo. And you know- the backstory behind that, if you, um, sorry for the interruption, but no problem. At that time, we had an executive editor that had a moratorium. It was like uh, no crooked horizon. He hated them. <laughs> he, he didn't understand them. And a lot of times we would shoot him just to tweak him in the, knowing that it would upset him in the meetings and everything. And I get it. I'm not a fan of crooked horizons. And that's something that a lot of young photo- photojournalists do is they think if they, if they tilt the camera, it's going to make them look like a professional. It's going to make uh, it look gonna, artistic, right? <laughs> yeah, it's going to add 20 years of experience to their yeah. portfolio. Uh, but it seemed to work with Weird Al. Uh, it so. was absolutely the correct choice. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's what, I, that's what I love about a lot of your photographs is this obvious Uh, you know, you place a lot of priority and importance on the visual design, you know, like a photograph like this, most of the photo is dark. You just have those areas of light that reveals these shapes. And I just, I absolutely love this photo. I think it's really spectacular and I'm not entirely sure what's going on. It looks like maybe some sort of, uh, I don't know, like some, some horses that burned or something like that. Like what's going on here? This is pretty crazy looking. Well, it was the PBR uh, professional bull riders association um, rodeo came to town. And uh, so I just went over there to shoot some, shoot some photos. And it's kind of funny because I'll have this discussion with you. I had a real hard time with this picture. 
uh, I mean, it was a very simple picture to shoot. Um, you know, they, what they do is they set the dirt on fire and it's from up above it, you can see it says PBR and then all the riders oh. come out and they introduce the riders. Um, I shot some very tight without the green lights at the top left. Mm -hmm. um, I liked this frame better. I even tried cropping the green lights out because my eye automatically goes to the green lights and it, my brain's telling me, you know, compositionally, that's taking me away from, you know, the, the subject of the picture. And it really, really bothered me at first. And finally, I'm like, after cropping it so many times, sorry, I'm cropping with my hand on mm -hmm. here, but um, <laughs> you, you just, you lose the color, you lose the crowd, you lose the cowboy at the left, you lose the cowboy in the shadows. Um, and I just decided, okay, I'm just going to leave it loose. And now I really like it because you've got a great diagonal from top left to top right. Mm -hmm. And as landscape people should know, uh, as it really any photographer should, should know, diagonals are extremely powerful and important mm -hmm. in, in your composition. Um, you know, and you can use those diagonal lines um, to, to bring a viewer into or out of the frame, however you want. Um, so it helps create that sort of uh, vertical, uh, or I'm sorry, diagonal line from top left to the rider and then back, you know, sort of uh, top yeah. left. But sometimes I still look at it and think, eh, I should have shot it a little tighter or a little better or something. But I, you know what, I think it's perfect the way it is. I think, I think what happens is that photographers learn early on, they get this drilled into their head that you've got to simplify your compositions. And, you know, it's good advice in the beginning because usually what happens when you're just starting out, you just point your camera at stuff. You don't even think about composition and you end up with these really unfocused compositions. I mean, uh, you know, artistically unfocused and, you know, learning to simplify is a good first step. But once you kind of master the art of simplification, I think it's better to learn how to go a little bit wider and to start building more sophisticated compositions. And so we're taught anything that takes away from your subject is a bad thing. Uh, I actually disagree with that. I think it's really bad advice because if you just sort of hone in on your subject, you're going to end up with images that are visually static. And so what I love about this composition is that strong, bright diagonal color, that, that blue and that green in the upper left, that actually does take away attention from the main subject. But the main subject is visually strong enough that it's always going to pull the viewer's eye back. You've got that really bright white light You've got that dynamic triangle shape formed by the light shining on the cowboy and then the cowboy in silhouette. The eye is always going to go there. And so having other points of visual interest in the composition, get the eye moving around the entire composition, they get the eye bouncing back and forth. You engage the viewer and that is a photograph that's going to hold interest over time. So I, I actually think it's perfect the way it is. I wouldn't well, not have changed a thing. Yeah, it's interesting because... Um, and I think the trick is to learn when to simplify and when not to. There, mm -hmm. there are times, I think, especially in photojournalism, you need the background out of the way. Um, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll say that comes up in times with grieving people. Um, some, sometimes you need the background in there. Sometimes you don't. Um, but, you know, the, the National Geographic folks um, who I've been ar around a few really wonderful geographic photographers, but Sam Abel was, you know, notoriously or it was famous for finding that background and he would wait a day, two days, three days until something interesting walked through that background. Yeah. Um, you know, and and they would always say and I would hear this over and over from the masters, you know, as I was coming up that the background's the most important part of your picture, whether it was a clean background or a complicated background, that was always the most important part of your picture. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, you know, I, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole too much. We, we can spend the entire day, you know, day talking about this. Um, but I'm going to I'm just going to raise one more point and then get back to your photos. Um, you know, that's kind of that strikes me as being something very similar to my approach when I'm taking landscape photography. Like the first thing I do is I go out and find what my background is going to be. I'm looking for that scenery that I think is going to look really nice in the background of my photo. And that's an important first step. But, you know, for me as a landscape photographer, and I think, you know, the way I'm going to say it is the same way you just described it. Once I found my background, then I start looking for my 
my foreground or my subject, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. And in landscape photography, it's, you know, usually something really interesting at my feet, you know, some sort of interesting rock or some patterns on the ground or something like that to juxtapose visually with that background. So, you know, really there's two or more visual elements that are competing for the viewer's interest. And I think that's exactly what you're describing. And that's what I see in a photo like this. You've got your overall scene, your overall background, like the, the background structure of the composition. And then you're waiting for that that foreground or that that object of interest, that subject to interact with that overall background composition that you've chosen. And so those two, I think, are actually very important. Like, you know, the way you just phrased it, that the background is the most important part. You know, I would say that the background and then the foreground subject probably, you know, are equally important. But yeah, I think that, you know, we're both sort of expressing it the same way. And, and last, uh, yeah, I was going to say one last thing too, mm -hmm. you know, in photojournalism, especially daily newspaper photojournalism, we don't have the time, uh, you know, most of the time, we don't have the time to to pick our backgrounds and wait for things to happen. Right. Photojournalism, <laughs> is, 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 it's very reactive shooting. And that's why a lot of times you see a lot of long lens photographs that yeah. the background stinks and we're just trying to clean it up. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I'd raised this point earlier that, you know, it, Photojournalism is is often a struggle to find uh, beauty and art in in moments that are really tragic, and you know I you know really the the photos that you've taken impress me in your ability to do that. And a lot of times it is about just capturing that that moment that really tells an amazing story. And this photo of the bull uh, jumping over the the man at the rodeo is just one of those great stories. I mean, this is the kind of photograph that you absolutely notice and just cannot take your eyes away from. Uh, and but I also think that and this must be, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm guessing that maybe this is the most enjoyable part of your job is finding those moments of pure joy when people are are just doing something that, you know, gives them happiness. And, you know, a lot of the news, a lot of photojournalism seems to be focused on things that are relentlessly uh, depressive. So I really enjoyed these photos in your portfolio where you were just capturing these moments of uninhibited happiness. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, you learn to appreciate um, all of those situations, I guess. And this was a crazy one. This was back in the film days. You know, I was doing a story on this island in, in Lake Erie and how uh, you know, it's sort of family time during the day. And then when the lights go down, it, it, uh, gets a little bit wild and it was just a I was just wandering around shooting pictures and this woman was having a um, bachelorette party <laughs> and uh, very uh, uninhibited I guess you could say but um, yeah that part is that part is really nice there are some days we call it um, uh, some newspapers call it roving you're out roving for wild art pictures some papers call it feature hunting and and you're just going out looking for pictures of people doing everyday things. And when you've had a couple of days where you're shooting, you know, daily assignments in business offices and things like that, especially once the weather gets good or if the weather's interesting, you know, like snowing or weird mm -hmm. storms, it's great to get out and just drive around and and uh, and look for pictures and come up with your own ideas um, for pictures and everything. And um there's some photographers out there, uh, Dave LaBelle, who was the master of, I mean, he wrote the book on, you know, on the great, um, what do you call it? The great picture hunt. Um, and uh, that part's, that part's really fun. Um, you know, nine times out of 10, you find fun, happy moments. Uh, there's always that 10th time you don't, you know, I, I, uh, I remember photographing a woman, and her son, they were at the, a local pond fishing and it wasn't a great picture, but I was struggling to find pictures. And, and when you're out looking for wild art, I always say, you know, you know, get a picture in the can first, you know, shoot something, takes the pressure off and then you can start looking for something better. And I remember photographing that woman and her son and and uh, I don't know why she told me this, but. She said, yeah, this is really hard because I just told him my, you know, husband and I got divorced. And I'm thinking to myself, boy, that'll be a great memory for him, you know, to have a newspaper clipping of that. But so sometimes people share a little too much. But 
um, yeah, usually it's, it's, it's really nice to get out and do that kind of photography. Yeah. And I, I kind of see that, um, photojournalism is very similar to street photography. I think that it, they're both, um, really kind of, you know, flip sides of the same coin. And, you know, part of that is just finding beauty in the everyday, uh, both types of photography. There's a strong emphasis on that. And it's, you know, very, very strong on photo uh, you know, storytelling. Uh, but you also uh, dabble into some other areas. You mentioned earlier underwater photography, and it looks to me like uh, this was much farther underwater than the first photo, which was just in a pool. <laughs> so uh, tell us a little bit about your experience as an underwater photographer. Well, so like I said, I've been a diver for about 20 years and um, uh, for about, I don't know, maybe probably 10 years of those or so, I was doing a lot of freelance underwater photography for uh, most of the big scuba diving magazines across North America and a couple of international ones. So this is at a, a place in Missouri called Bonterra Mine. Mm. And uh, it's an old flooded lead mine uh, where you can scuba dive there. So I was on assignment down there for scuba diving magazine. Um, yeah, this time I've been down there a couple times on assignment, but this one was for scuba diving magazine. This actually was the ended up being the cover of the magazine. Uh, but um, we, uh, I'm I'm thinking that was in about 95 feet of water, and it was the first time I had seen the engine down there. Uh, and one of the nice things about when you go places on assignment is a lot of times you get you get to see things that the normal public doesn't. So they have a trail system at Bonterra where You've got to build your experience up. You start with very easy dives and you work your way up to ones that are um, much more difficult to do. And this would be one of the more difficult dives. But uh, we dove it one day. I was down there for three days. We dove it the first day. I saw the potential and, um, you know, I knew they wanted some kind of cover shot out of there. And so Saturday night I was sitting in my Actually, where I was staying was in a uh, train caboose, which of all things. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to trying to think of some kind of cover shot that I could come up with. I knew I didn't have it yet. And I started thinking, well, if we went back down to this engine and I had another diver light light it from above and had this diver basically swim through the 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 light, it would make a really good vertical shot number one and number two i'd get all that black fall off where they could put you know type and um uh you know the, the 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 mast for the magazine and all that kind of stuff um so we actually so i actually sketched it out this is probably the most i've ever planned to shoot because we had very <laughs> limited uh we had very limited time at at uh you know at that depth sketched it out, showed it to my dive partners and said, you know, this is what we're going to do. And um, I couldn't believe it actually worked. Uh, but, you know, we were, I was using, I think the light, um, the diver at the top was holding is about a 30,000 watt light. Mm -hmm. uh, great, big, great, big, huge underwater light. And um, uh, the woman that's in the photograph, she was my writing partner. And she's got, I think, like a 15,000 watt light that she was uh, carrying. So we poured a lot of light on it. And, um, you know, it's kind of nice to do things different where you're not seeing things with on camera strobe and, you know, start using remote lighting. Your water works really, really well. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people don't understand how much of photography starts in the mind of the photographer. And sometimes it's a shot that you actually plan out like this, where you basically had an idea in your head and you had to figure out a way to bring it to fruition. A lot of times, you know, you're not in control of the scene. You have an idea in your head and you just have to wait for the real world to spontaneously align in a way that matches your creative vision. So even when you're out there, just reacting to things, you know, the, the more experience you have as a photographer, the more you start having ideas about what you want to capture. And so when you're out there reacting to things that are happening in the real world, you are thinking about these things. You're thinking about the shapes that you want or the, the mix of the colors or, you know, 
with that dive photo, the creative you know use of the black space, the negative space in a photograph. And so a lot of times, you know, what you're seeing, the reason why you're reacting to something that's happening is because that aha moment hits where you're like, this is what I'm looking for. This is exactly the sort of thing I wanted to get. And I get the feeling with this photo, which I absolutely love, that you probably had one of those aha moments when you saw all of the fishermen in the water just sort of spontaneously arrange in this beautiful S-curve shape. I think this is probably a simple illustration of this because a lot of times photographers are looking for these dynamic shapes like S-curves and diagonal lines. And when we see the world line up that way, we go for it. So I'm wondering, is that kind of what happened here? Or or did you actually yell out to these fishermen and tell them where to, to go? <laughs> no. Um, and, you know, and that's the thing about photojournalism. Unless it's a portrait, we're not, we're not directing anybody. Um, but I, I always I always tell people, you know, have an idea of what you want to shoot, even if you're going to a, a protest where you have you have no idea what's going to happen. Um, you have an idea in your head and uh, it's sort of like uh, the field of dreams in the movie. If you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot of times in photojournalism. If you have that idea of I want this kind of shot, if you're patient, that kind of shot's going to happen. Um, with this, I was just chasing the fog. Um, you know, this particular river, uh, it's a big deal every year when the walleye, the walleye run up the river and um, it gets fishermen from all over the place there. And the fishermen are generally in one long line. And um, I just happened to, to notice this. And, and I shot, I bet you I shot this, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 different ways trying to get the composition just right. Um, and then it bothered me, frankly, that, you know, we're kind of taught, you know, squares are boring. Uh, I don't <laughs> normally like to, I don't like to crop square, um, mm -hmm. but that it, it fit this picture, you know, perfectly. And um, so it, it was kind of like uh, everything just seemed to align the fog, you know, where, where the fishermen sort of fade out at the back of the S and, um, and it's a gradual fade because of the fog and everything. This picture on a bright, sunny day, to me, would not have been all that interesting. Um, but you add the fog in and you add the um, the shape of the fishermen and everything, and I think it, it works really, really well. Yeah, it's it's a remarkable photo. And it's, you know, just another example of what I've been talking about is that your job as a photographer is to find beauty and often in places where other people might not see it. And when you're doing street photography or photojournalism, often you're finding it in the places that are every day and uh, in the moments that are just part of our daily lives. You know, the kind of photography I do, you know, landscape and wildlife often involves going to exotic locations, looking for exotic animals, you know, looking for the most beautiful charismatic megafauna that I can find and making photographs of it. And, you know, I'm always trying to go to the places that are a bit more, you know, that are more overlooked, that are maybe not as stand up pretty. I love going to photograph in places, you know, landscapes that are much more mundane uh, because I, I like that experience of finding something relevant, something artistic, something photogenic in the areas that other place people are overlooking. And so, so much of the work that you're doing is just finding those beautiful moments in the everyday, the artistically relevant moments. You know, you, you know, something like this shot here, it's kind of an interesting story. And I, I do want to know what very quickly, what the story is behind this fish on the ice rink. But what I love about this photo is the shape that's created, that dynamic curving shape uh, created by the man and that shape extends to the fish. So you've got that S-curve shape formed by the man and the fish that brings the eye through the entire composition. So something that's visually engaging, you know, something that triggers a reaction from the viewer. Um, and on top of that, you've got this, this really uh, interesting curiosity in this photo. So I do, I do have to ask, what is going on with this fish? Why is this fish playing hockey? Well, so the, in Toledo, the, the minor league hockey team in Toledo, they're called the walleye. So <laughs> when, when, um, when they score a goal, a goal, the first goal of the game, somebody throws a walleye onto the ice. It's, it's <laughs> tradition. 
So the ice crew, they've got to wrangle the walleye and it's always a dead walleye. So they have to uh, get the, you know, pick it up and generally they'll swing it around and stuff. And so what happened was this guy lost hold of the walleye and it went sailing. But yeah, I mean, the to me, what made this picture, because I've shot this picture a thousand times, but there are two things to me that that make this picture. And one was the sharpness of the walleye and how it's curved like that. Um, so you can tell it's a fairly fresh walleye. A lot of them are frozen and everything. And also his glove says fish glove on it. If you look <laughs> at the writing on it, so you, you, you know, I mean, those are the little details in photojournalism you look for. So now, you know, the ice crew, this is something they, they're used to dealing with an awful lot. If they've got their own fish glove and everything, um, it, you know, it's just, just kind of a, a humorous moment. I mean, that, and that's, we shoot a lot of really serious stuff in photojournalism, but we also like to shoot pictures that just make people chuckle. That's probably <laughs> the, the best thing. And, you know, sort of going back to an earlier conversation with, um, you know, composition and detail and, and color and, and all that kind of stuff. The one thing as a photojournalist, you learn very quickly, you have to um, be able to sort of let go or be okay with is imperfection in your photography. Mm -hmm. like you're not always going to have good light. Um, I look at these pictures, you know, and I, I've been part of, um, you know, nature photography groups and everything. And, you know, oh, you've got the highlight blown by 10% or, you know, you need to bring mm -hmm. the shadows up. and you can nitpick apart any photograph if you try hard enough. And in photojournalism, you really have to get over that because you can't control all the elements, especially when you're shooting so quickly. You know, mm -hmm. you just don't have time to make uh, great exposures all the time. And a lot of times we're shooting JPEGs and not raw files because we have right. to move the, the, the pictures so quickly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, nowadays we're moving pictures from our, you know, right from the camera to the phone and, and back to the paper. Uh, so when the elements do come together and the little details like that, it's kind of, it's, it's really pretty joyous. Yeah. And you know, that, that's interesting the way you put it, because as a landscape photographer, I feel like everything in my photos is always just perfect. Every, all the, the focus, the sharpness from near to far throughout the entire image frame, everything is sharp and focused. The exposure always has to be perfect. If, if the exposure exceeds the dynamic range of your camera, you do a multiple exposure blend and do some HDR to bring it all together. And, you know, I have dabbled in street photography and I enjoyed the messiness of it. I enjoyed the chaos mm -hmm. of it and the imperfection of it. Uh, though I, I have to say, I, I, I find that, you know, obviously we're seeing the best of your photos here. Uh, so, you know, there's probably lots that don't make it uh, into the public eye where you just kind of screwed something up. Um, but I, I feel like you're actually making what I would consider to be the perfect choices regarding exposure and focus in these photos. Uh, and, you know, this is a really great example of that. Like, obviously, this was a, a very contrasty scene, lots of bright lights, but it was very dark otherwise at night. What I love about this photo is the selective exposure, you know, letting a lot of details go into silhouette uh, is, is a really powerful way of telling stories with a photograph if you do it correctly. And what I love about this photograph is the pattern formed by the woman in silhouette. Then you've got her dog brightly lit. And then you've got that shadow that comes uh, in from the lower right kind of pointing at the dog. So there's a pattern of three visual elements, dark, light, dark. And I think it works wonderfully. I think it's a really beautiful shot. And the composition works in part because you made the right choice with the exposure dealing with the contrast in the scene that you had. Yeah. And that's all stuff that when you're out on the street shooting, you don't even think about. It's just, right. it's, you know, after 30 some years of doing this, a lot of that stuff just, it just comes natural. Um, the, I spent a couple of weeks on the street with this woman and her dog, they were homeless and um, so I actually followed them through until they actually got an apartment and everything. But, yeah, it was really difficult to shoot um, both emotionally, you know, and going home to my my house and everything and then going back out the next day with her and stuff. But and finding her 
you know, that was always the big thing was trying to find her the next day. But um, yeah, you know, the focus of this story was as much about the dog as it was her. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of speed through a few of these shots uh, very quickly because we're running out of time. Love the aerial perspective here. You know, once again, finding the beauty in the everyday. You know, this pattern shot from above, I presume, with a drone. Just mm -hmm. uh, looks fantastic. Really kind of blows me away. I love the moment captured here. I just love the composition created by uh, these women uh, who appear to be graduating, I guess, high school and uh I just love the the shape that's formed that that creates this visual progression that just leads the eye throughout the image frame. Very dynamic. Love I love the use of framing and of negative space in photographs. It's a really great way of focusing attention on the central part of your of your compositional story. Uh, just the gloomy sky here. Just that really tells a great story. Uh, and I absolutely love this photo here. I'm just going to pause really quickly on this, and then we're going to. We're going to talk about the last photos in the presentation. And then if anyone has any questions before we end the discussion today. But what I love about this is you've got the boxer in the upper left and then the boxer shadow in the lower right. Or that might have been a different box. I'm not sure. Uh, the juxtaposition of those two visual elements, putting them opposed to one another diagonally makes this a very well balanced, but also a visually energetic shot. Absolutely love it. And I love the generous use of negative space here. All that negative space frames the two most important visual elements and the viewer just bounces back and forth between the two. It's a really wonderful photograph. Thanks. This was um, back in 2003. So this, and this was shot on film, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Devin Vargas, um, the boxer Devin Vargas was training for the Olympics. He was the uh, Olympic heavyweight representative. And so I did a photo story on him. He had a young family, he was a young kid, um, a young family and trying to balance the family life and training for the Olympics and everything. And it was shot in color. The color version actually is pretty good too. Um, and that is his, his shadow he was throwing there, but that's at his home gym or, you know, where he normally works out in, in Toledo. And um, mm -hmm. I, I liked how it worked in, in color quite a bit. Um, so I spent a lot of time, probably two or three months at least, uh, photographing him and, and his family as he got ready for the Olympics. And, um, you know, and that's just, um, you know, uh, one of my mentors, Joel Sartori, always told me, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of photography is not, um, you know, there's no magic bullet to making great pictures. It's time in the field. I mean, obviously you have to be very good and he's a brilliant photographer, but a lot of it is just time in the field. If you spend enough time in the field, you know, magical things are going to happen. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, let's close today with uh, just three photos from uh, one of the stories that you did a few years back. And I'm just going to go back to the original photo. We've only got about five minutes left, but if you want to just tell us about this story and about some of the experiences you had making photographs for this story, I think that'd be a great way to close our discussion. Yeah, so, so in 2000 and, um, 2003, I went to Vietnam. Uh, we did a story, we uncovered evidence that the U.S. had committed some war crimes in 1967 that were that were buried. Um, nobody had ever reported on them. The government, uh, you know, me, the My Lai massacre had, had uh, or no, the, this was would have been right before the My Lai massacre. And um, so they were covering up these war crimes. And one of our thoughts was, had they had they not been covered up, was you know things like My Lai may not have happened if they'd have cracked down on a couple of these rogue uh, troops. And so there was a. Um, uh, part of the 101st Airborne, uh, this force called Tiger Force, there were special operations, um, had murdered, raped, um, done some, tortured some, you know, horrific things they had done to so, uh, a bunch of civilians in the um, Songvei Valley area, the Central Highlands of Vietnam. So we went over there, spent three weeks there uh, trying to find witnesses and victims uh, from what they had done. This gentleman, Q Track, uh, was a young boy, saw his father murdered right in this rice paddy. And um, we'd interviewed him for a couple days. In fact, the, the next picture was the picture I shot before I shot this one. Uh, and this was while we were first 
first day or second day we were in Vietnam, I shot this. And I knew his, his he was recalling what happened and, and everything. And uh, we had left the Songhai Valley and started working north. And um, we got several hours away. And I realized that he was going to be the lead of the story. But I didn't have a picture that was strong enough to make him the lead. So we kind of, everywhere we went in Vietnam, we we attracted sort of a caravan of people. And so when, as we were headed north, I, I told the guys I was with the reporters, I said, we got to go back. I said, we have to turn around and go back. I said, I, I need to photograph this guy again. And I, and I want to go out in the field. I mean, I, I said, can you imagine this guy works every day in the field, right where he saw his father murdered. And um, I, I said, I can't imagine the pain and the loneliness of that. And so as we were walking out, um, there were a lot of people trying to sort of crowd around him and everything. And, and I realized that this was the picture and I, I sort of shooed everybody away. And, um, I said, just let me follow him out here. And, um, I just walked along with the film camera held up high, essentially just doing like Hail Marys. You know, I pre-focused on him. Um, this again was in the film days. I actually was using a, a graduated neutral density filter that I learned from my landscape photography days because I knew <laughs> the, sky, the, the sky was going to be blown out. And um, I just sort of was snapping away as we walked out there. And this was the frame I, I liked and ended up being the lead photo because it just shows his his loneliness. It also gave us the, you know, the location and the place of the story. It's a, what we call a scene setter. And those are real important to storytelling. So you know what it looks like um as you're reading a story and you can imagine um uh and imagine the the rugged terrain and and how you know chaotic things were so it worked really well yeah well i mean you know i think these these photos are uh just a really good example of what i was saying earlier that you know covering something like this was obviously a, a tragic event and covering the story must have been uncomfortable on some level um uh, but uh you know you just you did your job, which was to to find a way to tell the story uh, and to create something that is visually engaging uh, and to, you know, I dare say, find find beauty even in this tragedy. And that's what you do as a photographer is you're looking for those those visually dynamic stories that emerge that uh, you can use to to share with the viewers to tell that story, but also to, to pique their interest, to get them visually engaged, to, to make them want to learn the story behind the photographs. Uh, so Andy, that was really great. I'm really uh, glad that uh, you could come on and share your experiences and your insight. Um, any questions really quick for Andy uh, before we sign off for today, just put them in the chat box and uh, we'll, uh, We'll just take a minute or two to answer any questions. I know this is this has been a great presentation with a lot of information, so maybe no one's got any questions. <laughs> it's uh, usually a good sign if no one has questions because that means that we conveyed a lot of information and they're really just blown away by it. <laughs> well, I hope so. I appreciate you having me on, Ian. It was great yeah. uh, running into you up in the UP, and um, yeah, it, it's been it's been fun, and you know, uh, it's nice to be able to to get sort of on a forum that's not all photojournalism and everything and kind of spread and uh spread our gospel uh so uh yeah. it's you know like like i was telling you the other day you know photojournalism you know we're like the swiss army knife of photographers we're not going to be necessarily the best at any one discipline but mm -hmm. you can throw us in you can throw us in any arena and we're going to do okay so yeah. And, gonna... you know, I tell people all the time that if you really want to get better at photography, you've got to get outside your comfort zone and try a different type of photography. So, you know, a lot of my audience is very interested in nature photography. But, you know, if you want to be better as a nature photographer, go out and do some photojournalistic or street photography type photography. It'll make you a better artist. And mm -hmm. and I, I meant what I said earlier. What I love about that kind of photography is that you really have to work hard, dig down deep to find the beautiful in the everyday, in the mundane. You're not out there photographing the most beautiful mountains. You're not out there photographing some majestic polar bear, or, you know, doing something amazing like fighting another giant polar bear. You know, you're not out there photographing the most gorgeous Italian supermodels. You're just out there photographing the everyday, the mundane, the ordinary, the tragic. 
And if you can find beauty in those moments, and if you can make effective photographs in those moments, you will make great photographs no matter where you are. And that's it for today. Thank you so much, Andy. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad that we had that chance meeting up on the ice in Lake Superior. I'm also glad that Scott went back and got you instead of just <laughs> stranding you out there. And uh, this has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Ian.